Okay, the journey towards a remarkable iOS dev career continues. Welcome to the iOS Lead Essentials podcast. I'm Mike. And I'm Kayo. And today's topic is dependency injection. So I believe we have some questions. Let's dive right into them. And as always, we are going to reply with the premise that you want a remarkable iOS career, not just an average career. Nope. That's our disclaimer. <laughs> Let's go. Okay, what is dependency injection? What is it? Right. Should we clarify first what the dependency is? Because, mm. believe it or not, but many developers, they don't have this notion of, you know, dependencies. They just reference, you know, components from anywhere, and they don't think in terms of dependencies. They don't think in terms of communication between components and modules, and that can be very, very problematic. Yes. Because, folks, it's all about communication <laughs> between components and modules <laughs> at the end of the day. So, yeah, so a dependency, let's say uh, a very simple term, I guess, is if you have component A and it references component B, that means your initial component has a dependency on the other one. Right. So that's a source code dependency. That's, that's it. That's a source code dependency. And it could be on a uh, protocol, and, struct, class. It doesn't matter. A dependency is a dependency. Yes. And if exactly. this type lives in another module, you also have a module dependency. Exactly. So if right. you depend on URL, somehow you use URL mm -hmm. in a component, you depend on the foundation module. That's correct. And if you depend on NS manage object, you depend on core data. The whole yep. framework. Every time you say import and something else, that's a dependency on the module. And sometimes even when you don't type it, because the compiler can infer for you, you still that's depend correct, as well. on the framework. Yes. Implicitly. Now that's a keyword implicitly because we have basically two types of dependencies. We have the implicit ones and the explicit ones. And dependency injection is all about the explicit ones. But let's define, first of all, what is an implicit dependency? So when a component just references another component inside it, out of nowhere, basically, so if it creates the component, for example. Let's say if it creates the component, yes, then this component has an implicit dependency to the component that references. And it's implicit because you cannot see it just by looking at the interface of this component, right? You're not passing Ex the instance to that component. You may have like no parameters in the constructor and you may think, oh, there are no dependencies in this class. But there are many dependencies hidden implicitly. Yes, and that can create a lot of problems. So the opposite of this would be the external dependency, right? Where, as you said, a component makes known through its APIs, initializer, you know, methods, or other means that, hey, I need another component in order to operate. Right. Correctly, I guess. So you are right. defining the dependencies explicitly. Mm -hmm. So if you pass a exactly. parameter to a constructor, for example, you are explicitly saying, I depend on this type. Please provide me one so I can do my work. That is correct. Okay. So that's an explicit dependency. Right? You cannot use this object without passing this dependency to it. Yes. You're making it clear. Exactly that this object is going to use the other one. Yes. And that's something very, very integral uh, to dependency injection. Right. And if you understand this, then in my opinion, you got like most, most of the uh, ideas that dependency injection uh, introduces. Because at the end of the day, that's it. Dependency injection contains a set of, you know, like patterns, let's say, or mm -hmm methodologies to make dependencies explicit and make the communication of components 
clear, transparent, right? So you don't, you don't, as you said before, you don't hide uh, dependencies inside the components. So, for example, instead of letting again a component create its dependencies, you pass the dependency to it. And I've heard someone said, I don't remember who it was, that said that dependency injection is just a fancy way of saying passing a parameter. <laughs> Which is okay. not very precise way right. of defining right. dependency injection because dependency injection is passing this parameter in very specific ways. As you said, there are patterns and methodologies to do it. And there are anti-patterns yes. as well. Yes, we'll, we'll get there, I believe, at some yes. point. But yes, yes, absolutely. Um, you know what? If you think it's like passing a parameter, I don't think that's terrible. I think that's better uh, compared to, you know, like just instantiating components everywhere or using singletons uh, or mutable global state everywhere. You know, at least you have this idea that you're passing stuff somewhere else, right. which is like 50% um, of uh, the work required to, to, to understand how these things uh, work. And it's all about dependency management, right? Mm -hmm. Dependency management is one of the most important things you can do as a developer to create maintainable code bases. It's one of the most exactly. important things. So you can add behavior without changing components. You can change behavior. You can really unleash the power of polymorphism by just passing different instances, different types. Exactly. If you are after modularity, then this is the way to go. Otherwise, the, the, the craft and the tech debt is going to accumulate so quickly that you're just not going to be able to work, basically. Yes. So that's why you want to have like dependency injection, good dependency injection everywhere in your, in your systems. Okay, so the question was, what is dependency injection? Well, dependency injection is a set of patterns on how to manage dependencies by passing dependencies explicitly. Yeah, I think that's, that's a simple and good explanation. Or a fancy way of passing of parameters. Oh, right. <laughs> I was about to say that, exactly. All right. Oh, I have a passage of a book here. Working effectively with legacy code. Yep. The book says, one of the classics. Dependency management is one of the most critical problems in software development. Much legacy code work involves breaking dependencies so that change can be easier. That's how important managing dependencies is, is to make change easier because software is changing all the time. Software is soft or should be soft. Should be, yeah. And dependency yep. injection is going to help you manage the dependencies with yes. all the patterns and avoiding the anti-patterns. Yes, and we see many times at any level of their career, basically, developers just don't think. They don't think about the communication between components. They are creating just one component. They are designing a class, for example, and they only think about you know the class at hand. But a class on its own is not good. You know, the cl this class needs to, col to collaborate with other components so you can build something uh, useful. And this is, it's so important. This collaboration is so important and it, it has its own rules. So you need to know them. You need to know these principles and follow them all the time, right? Yes. <laughs> because if you, if you just, let's say, say, okay, no, I'm not going to follow this thing here. Well, no, it's, it's not going to cut it for you. It requires discipline because one tiny yes. decision you make right now, like, oh, let's couple these two classes here and let's couple these two modules. There's no harm, but you're passing a message to the team that it's okay to break modularity. It's okay to couple all the modules together. And very soon, yes, the whole code base is going to be a mess. Yes, it's going to happen 100%. No doubt about it. And there are a bunch of principles that help you create loosely coupled, easy to maintain, easy to develop and test code bases. And yes. dependency injection supports those principles. For example, the solid principles. Yes, exactly. Dependency injection is gonna help you with all of the solid principles because dependency injection supports and is supported by the solid principles. As you said, rules that if you follow them, you'll be on your way to deliver maintainable 
and easy to develop and test code bases. Exactly. Exactly. One thing that I, you know, it's it's one of those misjudged concepts. Like for us, software developers, following these principles, you know, like we're not going to get the prize by doing so. You know, like we're not no. going to. It's it's not right. It's when things go bad <laughs> that we get the opposite of the prize, right? So the reward is not making a mess, right? So that's why I think that's what why it's also very hard to use, uh, you know, like to 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 buy on the idea of dependency injection and following these all these principles, because you don't see anything magical happening, mm -hmm. right? It's just when things are bad, you start thinking uh, differently. That's um, like an observation for, again, on all levels of developers. Yes, but that's, those are big rewards. It, it relates to it, career it, fulfillment big. and delivering great products. So the rewards are, yes. rewards are big, they're massive. Absolutely. So if you build those skills and you can help teams deliver amazing software, you are so valuable in the marketplace, right? Yes, exactly. If you can show that, show up and help all those teams that are failing at this point and help them succeed, how much money can you make with that? How much career I mean, fulfillment can you achieve? It's a different, it's almost a different profession. You know, it's like, it's not just about writing code. You're not writing code. You're, you're literally building products. You're building systems. You're leading, right? Uh, it's, it's day and night. Yes. So if you're looking for a sign, you know, if you're doing things right, don't, don't wait for something good to happen. If you're not, you know, seeing a mess every single day, then you're doing things right. You know, that's the signal you should be looking for. Yes. Keep doing what you're doing. <laughs> exactly. Exactly. <laughs> All right. Let's next go. question. What is the difference between dependency injection and dependency inversion? That's a classic one. Yes. So the D in solid, dependency inversion principle. Yes. What is the difference? So, so you, I think, so the way I explain it to, uh, again, like uh, junior level developers is think one as the theory and the other one as the practice, basically. Right. So dependency injection is like the, um, is the way to do dependency inversion uh, efficiently, effectively, if you like, mm -hmm. right? Because, you know, dependency inversion is just a principle that states, right. you know, components should not depend on uh, concrete implementations, rather they should depend on abstractions so you can achieve a low degree of coupling, you know, throughout the system. Now, dependency injection says, okay, here are the ways that you can do that. The patterns, right? practices, and techniques. Basically, yes, exactly. Okay, so dependency right. injection is a collection of patterns and techniques, and dependency inversion is a principle, guidelines. Yes. On how to create yes. loosely coupled and easy to maintain software. Mm -hmm. And they work together. Yes, exactly. All these things go together uh, because they are necessary to achieve, you know, the the goal of modularity and a flexible architecture and design open closed systems. Right. So instead of depending on concrete implementations, as you said, instead of depending directly on core data, for example, in your components, you can create an abstraction. Right. Could be a protocol where you hide mm -hmm. the concrete implementation, which means you can develop things in isolation, maintain, extend mm -hmm. behavior in isolation, and also test things in isolation, and even replace core data with something else if you ever have to. Exactly. That is correct. And yeah, and maybe if you're not buying in the argument of, oh, I'm, not go I'm never going to replace core data, that's, that's fine. You don't, you don't need to. You're not doing it for these purposes. It's about the stability, it's about extension, it's about like testing in isolation. And then sure, you can test also in integration, perhaps the collaboration, you know, of your system with core data or uh, something similar, but it's just gonna make your, your life so much easier at the end of the day, yes. I believe. The test so, will be so much faster as well, so much more reliable, right? There will be no side effects exactly. in disk, even in yeah. memory yeah. or like 
any kind of like shared state. Yeah, exactly. So there are a lot of benefits so, and replaceability is something you aim for because of the other benefits around it, not just because you're going to replace core data, right? But yes. if you can replace something, it means you can also test it in isolation, right? You can also replace it with something else, even depending on the part of the system. Let's say in this screen, I want to have like an in-memory representation of this data. So I don't need to create yep. a whole core data stack to represent that. Right, I, I want just exactly. something like temporal that's going to be discarded, like ephemeral. Yeah. Yes. So yeah, replaceability, even if you don't replace something, you should aim for because it enables a lot of other principles around it. And again, I mean, I've said it in previous podcasts, like I think it's just the idea of thinking that things will never change is just, you know, like bad, bad investment, you know? <laughs> I mean, look at uh, look at the this summer we have um, this summer we we had Swift UI for example, right? Yep. What are you going to do there now? <laughs> like when suddenly like companies will start to migrate on this thing, but if your UI for example is uh, tightly coupled with core data with networking or whatever, you know that's going to be a nightmare. We write Perhaps the whole it's gonna thing. Be impossible exactly so you're gonna to have to rewrite the whole thing and then i don't know maybe it's okay because it's like apple's new thing and people say oh yeah well, there was no other way no there is another way and you should learn it and uh er everyone is going to be so much happier so make sure to manage your dependencies correctly put a lot of care in dependency management and dependency injection is a set of patterns that's going to help you manage your dependencies. Yes. Next, what are some dependency injection patterns? Okay. Yeah. So, first of all, we have constructor or initializer injection, where you pass a dependency through the initialization point of the component. So, you can guarantee that this component has all its dependencies throughout its life cycle. Exactly. And that's the desired exactly. one. That's the desired dependency injection pattern. That's the default. Yep, that's the default. Should be, I don't know, maybe 80% of the time, maybe even more. 100, uh, but why not? Why not? If you can, yes, 100, yes. So we have constructor or initializer injection, and then we have property or setter injection, which is a way to set a dependency after the object has been instantiated as a uh, as a property right right you normally use property injection when you have like a default value right you have a local yes. default that okay it works fine if you don't change it but if you want to change it you can set it exactly i think that's the only reason why you should use property injection when you have a local default but you can change it if you want to but ideally if you can, you should also use constructor injection instead. And just for sure, pass for sure. the dependency you want. Yes. Because most of the times we don't have a local default. That's correct. So next one, method injection. What about method injection? Method or parameter injection. So that's a parameter on a method that someone is going to call and it's going to give the dependency. Right. That dependency you pass to the method should not be held by the class after the method finishes. Right. So you pass this dependency, you use it, and you discard it. Yes. But constructor injection, exactly. when you pass a dependency, you most likely are going to hold that dependency throughout yes. the life cycle. That's the main difference. Uh, the, in method injection, the d dependency is being passed in every call, right? You have a method, and you're calling the method, and the dependency can vary basically, right? Mm -hmm. Based on the context, based on the consumer, in constructor injection, it's just like you're passing it once and that's it. So let's say if you have a, an HTTP client, you can either start it with a base URL and you have mm -hmm. methods that you invoke and it's going to use the base URL to append some path to it and perform the request. Or you can pass the URL you want to perform the request to. For example, if you have a method called get, you can pass the URL as a parameter 
and you use that URL for that specific request. But if you have a base URL that should always be used, you just pass in the constructor. Exactly. Mm -hmm. if, it, if you need that in order for the component to work correctly, then you go with the constructor injection. Like another example is the index path, for example, right? Mm -hmm. uh, in, the, in the APIs of um, the table view and the collection view, where you, know, you want to render uh, a cell right. at the specific index path. And it changes every single time, you know, because you want like the first uh, section, you know, the first row, the second row with the first section, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So this method is being invoked with, with a new dependency there every single time. The dependency right. in this case being the index path, right? So if it varies, mm -hmm. you use method injection. If it doesn't vary, constructor injection. That's it. That's it. Cool. Makes sense. Yeah. Oh, there's another pattern. Composition root. Yes. Because everyone talks about constructor injection, method injection, property injection. But composition root, probably one of the most important ones. Yes. Where is it? No one talks about it. <laughs> Come on. Yes, everyone, everyone loves the, the other one, the ambient context. But no one is... Okay, we we'll get there. We'll get there. <laughs> yes. So um, what is composition root? Yeah, I, composition root is the idea where after you have designed and de declared your components, you know, when you have laid out the dependencies nicely, you know, like uh, with constructor injection and uh, the other methods, well, someone needs to instantiate these objects. So the composition root says there is just one centralized place and everything, all the instantiation is going to happen in there. Okay, so composition root is a centralized place where objects should be instantiated and composed. Yes. Right, because you go there, you follow all the principles, you separate your modules, you create clean boundaries between them with abstract interfaces, protocols, closures, but at some point you need to compose all of them together. So your application exactly. can run. And if you create these clean interfaces, these abstractions, but you go there and you create the dependencies inside the components, you break the whole separation. That's why you move all the composition, all the instantiation to one centralized place, right? Normally main, the main function in the application that starts the whole application. That's the place where you inject all the dependencies, either yes. manually or using a dependency injection container. Right. And if you're using a dependency injection container, by the way, the composition is the place to use that. Right. right. Throughout the application. Yeah, you should not um, use dependency injection containers outside the composition root. Right? It's part of the composition exactly. root. You can create composers exactly. to help you compose these objects, right? Factories, whatever you need to do. But all of those composition objects, factories, should all live in main, in the composition root. Yes. They should not be called it, by other modules, ever. If you're aiming no. for loosely coupled systems, right? Yes. If you're aiming for a remarkable iOS career. Exactly. And it might be singular root, a composition root, but it's an idea. Again, it's, it can contain a lot of components, a lot of factories, for example, or assemblers or composers, whatever, right? So um, th this is important to, 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 to make the distinguish there that, yes, it's not just one component that perhaps instantiates everything. Because like, imagine if you have, I don't know, like a huge object graph, right? That's probably no good. You know, you should split um, your instances excuse me, your instantiation based on what these components are doing, right? So networking with networking, database with database. Right. So if you think if you think that your components are like a Lego uh, block, you know, the composition root is where you stack your Lego blocks. That's that's the place. Right. It's a fun part where everything works together <laughs> and you can play. Yes. And it's it is tempting to just go there and instantiate the objects that you need, right? Let's say 
I want to perform a network request in my view controller. Yes. It's tempting to just create my client there and perform the request or even access it through a singleton directly. Right? It is tempting, right. but that's going to couple your system and it's going to make your code less extendable, less testable. Yes. It will complicate the whole object graph. Exactly. But if you pass a dependency with a clean interface, then you can even replace it with other things during tests. You can easily extend the functionality of that client without breaking anything else. Yes. Th that's why you need processes because let's, let's take what you just said as a fact, right? Which I believe it is. So you might be tempted to do that and it's going to end up in high coupling, let's say, or yes. hidden dependencies. And you know these things are bad. So how do you fight that? Right. And you need processes, discipline processes in place to, uh, to work against that. And perhaps like, for example, we use and we teach the process of a spike, you know, like see what you want. First of all, see what you want to achieve. Think, mm -hmm. you know, yes. <laughs> test it, test it out, you know, in a, uh, discardable solution. And then once you understand what you need to build, then start shaping these abstractions, perhaps, or maybe you don't start from the abstraction, you start from, you know, the behavior of your system. And slowly, your, your component, your design emerges into something that, you know, it follows these principles, you know, it follows uh, good dependency injection rules, right? So it doesn't necessarily need to start like this, but it should end like this, right? Yes. When you're going to create a pull request asking uh, for a review to uh, for your contributions in the code base, you know, it, it should not contain any sort of hidden dependencies, temporal coupling. So you just know that bad things will come if you are tempted to, you know, start instantiating, let's say, classes or components rather inside other components. You shouldn't, you shouldn't be doing that. Right. But it is tempting. And sometimes you, you want to do the right thing, but you just don't know how to do it. And that's yes. why you spike, right? You go there and you yes. just maybe just instantiate the HTTP client in the view controller. Just do it, right? Yeah. And then say, where can I move this? How could I separate it? How can I move it to one level above, right? How can I inject this thing now? Now that I know what it does and how it does it, right? Now I have more information about it. I'm unstuck because the idea of a spike yes. is to get unstuck. And then you stop, you look at it, you understand it, then you discard it. Then you do the right thing. Now that you have the information, you write a test, you start with a test, make the test pass, and you commit, and then you create a pull request. Exactly. Don't be stuck. If the principle no. is getting you stuck, get unstuck by spiking some ideas, you know, like just go free, no rules. Yep. But as soon as you are unstuck, as soon as you know what you have to do, you discard the playground, discard it yes. and do the right yes. thing. Yes. So if someone wants to um, improve on these things with their current code bases, it doesn't matter if it's legacy or whatever, right? Like there are very simple ways to identify what's wrong, right? For example, go and see how many classes instantiate other classes inside them, right? Just, just go on Xcode on the search functionality and, you know, just open a parenthesis and close the parenthesis uh, and just see what's going on in there, right? Sure, especially if you're not using, if you're not using um, initializer injection, then it's going to be, you know, you're going to see a bunch of instances like this. And as you said, like, if you have a UI, and then inside this UI, you have like a, a networking component, it doesn't matter what, what it is, right? Your old session, or a singleton or something, I don't know, like, that's bad. That's, that, that should probably be um, injected, A, B, it should be uh, and some something abstract, you, you shouldn't be passing the uh, concrete type there because for example again and that this comes to the the, the topic of uh, extensibility and re replaceability let's say 
your feature starts out as a as a network uh, fetcher, right? So you're fetching a bunch of data. So yes. you're building out the UI and you say, okay, I'm going to connect to the network and I'm going to fetch a bunch of data. And that's it. So this in your code reflects, you know, with a, probably a view controller having a, an implicit dependency um, to a whatever, like a networking component, a singleton perhaps, I would say most frequently. So you finish your feature very quickly, that's it, right? Next sprint, okay, uh, we need to uh, like uh, add another um, feature there. You know, that's <laughs> you need to change this thing now, for, first of all. Okay, next sprint, we, we need to add persistence on this thing. Now the problem is that you're probably gonna add persistence in the class of the, 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 the networking in the first place. Probably, right? yes. Which is like, yeah, <laughs> no, it's a big no-no. But you have all these frameworks um, so, that are also going to help you do that, right? All those frameworks is going to incentivize you to couple everything. That's why you should yes. be worried of those frameworks. Yes. Separate them. Yes. Don't let them get into your business logic, into your UI. Separate it and inject exactly. the dependency. Yes. So, yeah, I mean, otherwise you're going to end up with like suboptimal systems. That's it. Okay, so next question. Very popular one. Why bother using dependency injection at all when globals are more convenient to use? Right. Why okay. inject dependencies everywhere, create a composition route if I can just use a single tone? Okay, it's a segue to what I just said. I mean, the, the first problem uh, with singletons and globals is that they are going to introduce a hidden dependency. As, a, as an exercise, uh, like go on Xcode again on the search thing and do dot shared or dot shared instance or dot, I don't instance. know, uh, dot instance, right? And check out how many things are just hidden there. I mean, it's, it's unbelievable. <laughs> it's implicit. It's, it's implicit, yes, and it just it increases the probability of like catastrophic events, you know, bugs and race conditions and other uh, problematic situations that they all result in crashes and right. you know memory leaks and stuff like that. So, if you just use URL session shared the shared instance, and you're trying to debug, why am I seeing the same result here? Every time, even though I have no connection, I still see a success result. You have no idea there's a URL cache behind the scenes. This other singleton or global mutable state. Yes. That is not explicit because I never set it. Yes. I didn't have to do anything. It's very convenient because you get this caching for free, but you just had no idea it was there. Exactly. Um, and then you have specific ways to use this cache. That's the... That's the the idea of like temporal coupling as well. And there is some order that needs to exist in order for the system to function properly. Yes. I mean, good luck trying to, to, to find these things out or debug them. Um, yeah. <laughs> for example, the URL cache, it has a shared instance, right? But that's not a singleton because you can replace it. So that's the ambient right. context anti-pattern. Right. That's another form of dependency injection, and that's the ambient context, right? Yes. So you can change this dependency at runtime, right? You can change it. But if you change it after the cache has been used already, you're going to get unreliable caching throughout the lifetime of the application. So look at this from the documentation. URL cache docs. You can create a custom URL cache object and set it as the shared cache instance. You should do so before making any calls to this method. Temporal right. coupling. That's temporal right. coupling. The order of invocation changes the behavior. Yeah. You can break the system, break your assumptions. Yes, exactly. And this is bad, right? Because the URL cache APIs allow you to do those bad things easily. It doesn't prevent it. Yes. But if you're using dependency injection, you cannot even compile 
if you do the wrong thing. Yes. At least document the the order through a test. You know, like document the invocations. At, at least, you know, uh, just do that. And if you're using a framework that was built by someone else, like Apple or something you got on, on the internet, and you don't know about those temporal couplings, you might misuse it. It's going to compile fine. It's going to run fine. But maybe your customers are going to find the bugs, the bugs that come with temporal <laughs> right. coupling, because it's so hard to replicate those conditions. Yes. Yes. Right. So better yes. APIs would not allow you to do the wrong thing. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. And globals will make your code rely on runtime behavior. Yeah. Yeah. In Swift, you have such a nice compiler helping you. Why not use the power of the types to help you build systems? They are never in a wrong state. It's the misconception of the, you know, how easy and how fast things are to develop. I think that's the problem there. So it's not even a sacrifice for globals at the end of the day. It's just like, no, this is the way to develop because you don't have to follow rules basically you know it's, it's very intuitive okay i need to do this i need to fetch something in my ui boom you just do it yeah, it's convenient. Serve dot fetch it is yes. convenient it is and maybe yes. that's the way to go for some apps you know for very simple apps but if you want a remarkable career you're going to be getting bigger bigger challenges higher risk right applications that require a different level of technical excellence, yes, right. The bar would be super, super high. Exactly. I mean, you just know that these things are trouble. So, if again, if you are managing risk, high rewards, high stakes, you know, <laughs> just don't use them. It's very simple. Just yeah. learn the other way. Yes. And m mitigate the risk. Just. Don't create tight coupling. Don't create temporal coupling. Don't create, like, I don't know, like sit situations that might lead to something bad. You know, very simple. <laughs> it's the convenience versus <laughs> discipline. Yeah, and going through these things. It's, uh, yeah, I get it. You know, I get it. Yes, but it is tempting. And it never goes away. Yes. Okay. You may learn the principles, but it's sometimes you're going to look at, oh, if I just had a single tone here. No, <laughs> don't do it. You just learn the discipline. Yeah. But the temptation will be there. Exactly. That's, that's the other thing that I think there's like a group of behaviors that when you start to, um, you know, like practice testing, for example, testing first, right? I mean, all these things come together. Like if you start testing first and then you start like to do testing first, you need to have uh, proper dependency management and you're going to use dependency injection. So, you know, like if you're using dependency injection, you're not going to use globals, for example. Why? Yes. Because, you know, like it doesn't fit my style of coding. It doesn't fit, you know, my practices. And as a, as a team leader, now that's for the folks that are higher in ranks and experience, like I think you should definitely strive to, you know, set a culture that does not tolerate, you know, other, other practices. So you should set high standards. And if you see that your team cannot comply to the high standards, you help them become better. You train them. Exactly. Don't exactly. lower the bar. Help them <laughs> get stronger, better, faster, smarter. Yeah. You don't need to lower the bar. Trust your team. They are smart. They want it. They want to do a great job. Give them the tools. Give them the training. Go for it. High standards, high rewards. By the way, what you're saying now, I don't know, it just clicked with the previous podcast we did where with the design patterns and the architecture, uh, the UI architecture patterns, where we were talking about which is like the best pattern um, and how, you know, the community and like the job listings, they always list, you know, like this is how, what we want, MVVM, MVP, Viper, you know, whatever. But like, if you now, if you see in this podcast, for example, like we don't, we don't use, we don't mention these terms because if you follow these principles we're talking about today, for example, right? Like proper dependency injection, loose coupling, 
provide a good abstraction between components, the dependency inversion principle, in other mm -hmm. words. I mean, these pattern things become so secondary in nature, you know, because they are computed basically, right? Yes. They, you don't even care about these things. All you need to care about is like proper separation of concerns and have like dependency inversion. Uh, and, you know, like suddenly the single responsibility principle is going to come. Like, obviously, as a, as a result, your system is going to be open for extension and closed for modification. You know, it's, I think these are the, the traits you need to invest in. And, and I think you mentioned in, in the last episode as well that, yeah, like, don't, don't, don't do what the majority is doing, the average is doing, you know, like yes. go for the deeper understanding, the deeper learning, like read a bunch of books. This is an excellent book that you mentioned in the beginning of the episode, by the way. It's, uh, there's another one uh, by Mark Simon, I believe, right? Yes. The Dependency in Injection. Like fantastic books. And I don't think they ever mention, you know, MVVM yeah. or... Uh, they do, but it's because if you follow the principles, you end up with those patterns. Because trying yes, to learn the right. pattern front, I think is the, the wrong way. If you learn the foundation, of you're going to end up with the patterns. If you just learn the template and you don't know the foundation, it's going to collapse. You're going to build something that will collapse because it has no foundation. Exactly. Right. Exactly. So those books, they mention it just to say, oh, by the way, we end up with MVC here. Have you noticed? Oh, we end up with MVVM uh -huh. here. Have you noticed? And so on. That's the right order. You learn the foundation and you build on top of it. I've seen some amazing results from students that had zero experience in coding, right? And the, I'm talking about people that actually became professionals, right? Like they're out there building uh, big systems. Yes. And the way to, I remember, like, it makes such a big difference if you, if you start them out by thinking about these things, right? Just, not just like, okay, let's put something on the screen rather than, okay, let's design something, you know, a class, for example. Now let's design another class and let's make these two classes talk to each other, right? So forget about UI, forget about like all these things. No, just like simple principles. Like how do you map, first of all, you know, like in the beginning, the real world into something that the machine can understand, something that the tools that you have at hand can accommodate you with. And then, you know, yeah, let's, let's, let's make them play together. That's, that's the, such a, it's been such a, you know, different kind of experience for, for teaching and for like the, the results have been insanely successful, I think. Yes. Yeah. And of course, like I'm, I'm oversimplifying here, right? It's not that simple, but I'm talking about the traditional approach where, okay, you need to show something on the screen. You just, you need to copy paste code and all that stuff, yes. right? The first lesson is setting up the IDE, putting something on the screen, some buttons that you press goes to the other screen. And that's valuable right. because like you feel this accomplishment. Yeah, exactly. But deep down, if you ask them to create another screen, they won't be able to, <laughs> right? So that's the thing. If you just keep learning without the foundation, you cannot actually go and, and solve any other problem. Yes, and that's bad. That's bad because you can't do much at the end, you know, and then you have like, you, you start a second tour, you know, for learning and... Um, or unlearning, because if you don't learn the foundations, you're going to build this weak foundation and these weak yeah. assumptions and wrong assumptions. Yeah. So you have to rebuild the whole foundation after you already know something, like some templates, that's so much harder. Yes, exactly. It's so much harder, especially in a hot market, you know, because some of these things are not visible. Some of the things that, you know, like you have not understood, they are not visible because of the uh, incentives of the market, you know. So yes. there is very limited growth if you just yes. go for the templates. If any, if any, right? Like, let me put that. That's my opinion. But if any growth, right? Yes. Because growth, you know, like you, it, it can be negative, you know. And I think that's I think that's what happens after a while, you know, because if you don't like again, if you're not going to go into the these principles like the solid principles, dependence injection, all these things. Well, one thing is for sure, 
you're not going to be able to to provide value to businesses that want to have like amazing results and build like you know complex products it it's not going to happen right so this is like an opportunity cost where you know time, like you could you could have been right. studying you could have been practicing uh, on these things but you didn't so I'm, i don't know it's or you will get a position in those businesses but it's going to be a low position right you're going to have yes not the rewards you're supposed to because you're not right. making decisions yes Exactly. If you want a remarkable um, career, you need to build those skills. Show up and deliver. Deliver your best work every day. No excuses. Nope. Exactly. It's that simple. <laughs> yeah. Some people complain that, oh, my boss doesn't allow me to do this. My boss doesn't give me time. That's the best opportunity to deliver value. Earn the trust. Show them that that's the wrong path. And show them why and deliver. If you can over deliver with a boss that is complaining about time, you're going to change their mind. You yeah. understand how valuable this is. They're going to see something <laughs> yes. they don't know. They're going to see that this person knows more than I do. And that's yeah. why people hire you because you know something they don't. If you keep showing up and over delivering, that's it. That's all it takes. I think that's the third time we mention, and I think it's you that you mentioned. This, you know, these things in in our podcast, and I believe, I think we should mention it every single time because it's so important. <laughs> you know, like just this being relentless, basically, with the growth and the, um, yes. you know, like the 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 learning and the practicing uh, and the execution, and then just you know, like over delivering. That's, that's what it takes. Yes. It's so sad when we see senior developers, right? Five, six years experience making the salary that a junior or a mid-level is making, like with one, two years experience. Yeah. There's no reason for that. Yeah. Spend some time, learn these things. Step up. And step up, yeah. That's it. Okay, let's carry on. Okay. What is the best way to learn dependency injection and dependency inversion? Well, I think we just gave the answer. Yeah. Learn, right. practice, execute. Infinite loop. That's it. Keep practicing, keep learning, and executing. Teach others. You know, if you want to really, really learn something, start teaching people around you about it. You're going to build authority. People are going to respect you more. You're going to be helping others. You'll be grateful and you're going to prove that you know what you're talking about. Because when you teach someone yes. about something, they're going to ask you questions. You're not ready to reply. And you're like, oh, actually, I don't know this topic that much. I better learn more. And the cycle yeah. continues. The cycle continues. Exactly. Nothing to be embarrassed about. Nothing to be sad about. You just, you know, that's the fact you don't know. Just yeah. no, you know, like yeah. <laughs> learn. And then, so you know. You never lose. Uh, if you don't know, now you know you don't know. That's yeah. the best thing can happen. Exactly. Just go there and learn. Everyone went through this phase and goes through this phase every single day when they want to, um, you know, uh, evolve, grow. Yes. As a developer, as a athlete, whatever, right? But uh, another thing I, I want to say here is the like how you're doing these things, right? Like if you're training and you don't see the results, for example, well, maybe you're following the wrong um, books or courses or whatever, right? So you need to target the right uh, content. That's for sure. Yes. Uh, otherwise, otherwise, it's just it's not going to happen. Like you, you may be going, you know, around this topic, and you know, like just seeing a couple of references in the course, in the book, in whatever the video, but you need to dive deep, and that's hard because you need to look the problem in the eye, and you need to yes. uh, acknowledge that you don't know, <laughs> you don't know some stuff. Um, yeah. Again, so, you need a solid foundation. Yep. Yeah. That's it. You need a solid foundation, not shallow 
blog posts. Oh. Nope. <laughs> Careful. Yep. Careful with your sources. And we mentioned it last time as well, like try putting constraints in your uh, in your practice. Like for example, don't use singletons ever. So I think like for I mean, some of our students that in your practice, right? You can use singletons. In your practice. There's nothing wrong with singletons. Just don't yes. access them directly everywhere. Yeah. You can create yes. singletons and inject them in the composition root. Nothing wrong with yes. that. Yes. If you want only one instance of an object, you can use a singleton. Don't access it directly. Inject it. Exactly. And I'm talking about the, the developers out there that they, they want to uh, reach that next level. So I'm assuming they are not aware of the composition route and all these right. uh, principles. So the point is like just replace Singleton with whatever, you know, something that can introduce risk in your code base. It doesn't matter. But if you know, for example, that something might be bad or you're hearing here, here for the first time that, you know, this thing X, Y, Z can introduce risk. Well, stop using it. And the best way to do that is by creating a safe environment where you can try these things out, you know? Practice. So practice, yes. Pet project. Exactly. Yes. Maybe you're not confident you enough yet to do it at work. Do it at home. Yeah. No, you should not be doing that, you know? <laughs> like you need to practice first, right? For example, I would say that the majority of um of uh, blog posts or courses or whatever out there, when it comes to networking, they're gonna couple the UI with networking, right? As we mentioned before, that's that's the way they show you. So now if you learn this thing, and again, you're practicing again and again, these things, uh, and you know they're bad, well, try not to do them, right? It's very simple. Just try not to use a single done or a global there and use dependence injection First, yes, and not just dependence injection, but create a clean interface, an abstract interface, right? So apply exactly. the dependency inversion principle at the same time. So you don't depend yes. on the concrete type. The yes. source code dependency should be to an abstract interface. And what you just said, I think after a while, it becomes such a mechanical algorithmic process where, you know, you identify there is an implicit dependency inside my components. I want to I wanna remove it. I want to make it an explicit dependency and I want to conform to the solid principles. What do I do, right? Right. And it's, it's, yeah, it's like uh, you follow the same recipe every single time, right? You locate this dependency, this implicit dependency. Let's, let's try to pull it out, first of all, right? So someone else passes this dependency, right? How do you do that? Well, let's see. We said, you know, Constructor injection should be your default choice. Is this an option? Yes. Excellent. <laughs> now someone else is going to feed that. Okay, is this component that you're uh, working on, does it communicate with a concrete type or an abstract type? Oh, it's a concrete type. Okay, well, let's try to introduce an abstraction there, right? Uh, perhaps hide it behind a protocol. Yes. And then w we just ended up with what you mentioned. And I see a lot of beginners trying to use frameworks to solve their problems. You don't need any framework. It's better if you just do dependency injection like manually. You don't need a DI container. You don't need anything. You don't need like sorcery generating interfaces for you. No. Simplify the yeah. problem. Practice, practice, practice. Exactly. Exactly. Because they come with a cost as well. And it's hidden. Big and there's, time. <laughs> and there's a learning curve in there to learn yeah. the framework, right? To learn those tools. Exactly. When you're trying to learn the principle, forget tools. Yeah. Forget the tools. Focus on the techniques, on the foundation, on the principles. Yes. So next question. I have been studying for some time, but I can't seem to understand dependency injection. How can I effectively learn to use it in my workplace? Okay. Learn, practice, execute. Yeah, I mean... Have you read books about it? Which ones? Do you take yeah. notes? 
Did you practice the techniques? The dependency <laughs> injection book. If you read for 30 minutes a day, you're going to finish in less than two weeks. Come on, that's two weeks. Yes. That's two yes. weeks. And after two weeks, you're going to be so much better. It's a no-brainer. Maybe someone's going to say, oh, Simon's book is in C uh, sharp, right? Like, it is in C sharp. It doesn't sharp. apply in Swift. Yeah. No excuses. Well, no excuses. The exactly. foundation is I mean, all there. The principles are there. It's, it's the same thing. Don't see it as a barrier. Maybe see it as an opportunity. You will learn it and you're going to write a book in Swift and make huge profit. Come on. No excuses. Yeah. 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 Exactly. It should not be an excuse. But it's not in Swift or another language of your choice or whatever. Right. You just need to put the work and persist. And if it doesn't um, click uh, in the first, second, tenth try, it doesn't matter. Just go after it again. It will click. At the yes. same time, train smarter. You know, like find good sources, mentors. Um, mentors talk to people exactly like so if he cannot if apply able... in the workplace it means that there's no one in the workplace that can help him oh right? that's what i want to say now i mean yeah maybe he's or... working alone or he doesn't have a team with high standards and yes. that's tough both cases are difficult yes because if you are alone you can at least try things out when you are in a team with low standards, they're not going to give you the space to try out things. No. no it's going to be very hard. So try on your own. Find good mentors. Train on your own time at home. Yeah. Or if you can, find a better team. Yeah. Higher standards. It's simple, but not easy. Yeah. And it takes time. That, that as well, right? <laughs> Patience. So. Patience and good expectation setting, right? We'll say you are out of a boot camp and you want to use dependency injection properly and test first develop. Like that's not going to happen, right? That's forget about that. Yes. You know? Like set a realistic expectation. Let's say one year from now, how are my skills, right? Two that's years ambitious, from now, you know? you know, one year is ambitious. Yes. When one year is ambitious, like, yeah, like you need completely different kind of training to to be able to understand these things and you need the space and time to apply it you know so you need to find a team that can help you yes if you want to go fast you need to go with people that can guide you yes you know that's the way to go fast I learn from others exactly that they understand your pains, they understand your struggle, and they can uh, provide uh, good advice on you know how to navigate through these dark, unknown, you know, like concepts. So that's it. Learn, practice, execute. Find people that yep. can help you. If you want to go fast, find a team with high standards. Yes. Okay. Next. Where there are patterns, there are anti-patterns. So, <laughs> what are some dependency injection anti-patterns? Okay, I mean, we, we mentioned uh, a few so far. So, I would say the, the biggest one is the ambient context that I see. In that, iOS, uh, yes. In, in iOS, yes. It's like this idea that global uh, mutable state is fine. And it should be um, it should be um, preferred to constructor injection. So ambient context, it's those kind yeah. of environment, global variables where you can replace like a database, a network stack. It's yes. pretty much a single tone, but with a mutable shared instance. So it's yes. worse than a single tone. It's like the URL yeah. cache shared instance that we mentioned. That if you change it in the wrong time, you're going to have unreliable caching throughout the system. It has temporal yes. coupling. It's hard to maintain. It's hard to develop. A small change in a part of the system, one single line of code, can break completely unrelated modules. Yes. 
come on, we can do better than that. If that doesn't <laughs> doesn't signal something to you, I don't know. <laughs> like, yeah, it's bad. So ambient um, context is very similar to the singleton pattern, right? You have a shared global instance that you can access anywhere, but it can be replaced. Yes. And runtime. Dangerous. Exactly. Some people call it context, environment, whatever. Any kind of global way of injecting dependencies is an anti-pattern. Yeah. Because you're accessing the dependency directly to this global pointer. Exactly. No. Constructor injection should be preferred. And when you do it, you move all the dependency injection to the composition root. Yes. And that's how you manage the dependencies in a clean way. That's how you create modular systems. Otherwise, you have monoliths. Even if you have frameworks, but every framework depends on the other framework, it's a monolith. You get all the downsides of separating frameworks, the hard to maintain setups, but none of the upsides. Yeah. You end up with spaghetti code and spaghetti <laughs> architecture by design. That's the problem, you know, like these things introduce state in a way that you just, you know, like you're gonna have coupled systems. Yes. End of, end of story, like that's it, it's gonna happen. It's a certainty. And if that's not bad enough, you also get the nasty bugs, like temporal coupling. When you need to set up the dependencies in the right order, even when you're running tests, if you're running them in parallel, sometimes they pass, sometimes they don't pass. When you run tests in random order, sometimes they pass, sometimes they don't pass. The argument sometimes there is, okay, I'm gonna have a teardown method or like a mechanism for cleaning things. My question every time is like, why? Like, just don't do it in the first place. Like, why do you, sure, you can mitigate these things, right? <laughs> but why would you ever do that? You know, just, it's, it's so much cleaner, it's so much simpler not to do it. Yeah, so don't fix the symptoms, fix the source of the problem. Yes, exactly, exactly. And the, the, the problem is, uh, it's not ambient context. The problem is learn how to use dependency injection properly because you should want, um, like a very, uh, you know, like to work at this high level and create good systems, right? And get the rewards. And get the, of course, like that's going to be, that's going to be the, the, the side effect, right? That's going to come. Of course it's going to come. Career fulfillment, right? Being paid what you're worth, delivering yeah. software you're proud of every day. Yeah. You know, working with people that you like. Those are all side effects of high standards. Exactly. And be happy. <laughs> I mean, context is not going to make you happy. No, it won't. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe for a while. Right? You can solve yeah, your problem like, immediately. It's exactly. a short-term yeah. solution. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, I can move this ticket to done. Finally. You're right. Yes. Finally. Exactly. You're right. <laughs> but a couple sprints down the road, yeah. It's going to come back. I don't think so. It's going to come back to collect the debt. Yes. So no ambient context. That's not the solution. It's an anti-pattern. Yeah. Okay, other one. Overloaded constructors. Or, in Swift, default parameters in the constructor. The problem is, you create your abstract interfaces. You separate the modules. Everything's right. clean. You can inject mocks during tests, right? You can inject in-memory representations of the database. You can do everything yes. you want. But you go and you have a default parameter to yes. a concrete core data stack or a concrete URL session stack. Now you coupled your code. You introduced a source code dependency, a module dependency because of the initializer. Yes. You just exactly. broke the dependency inversion principle. You did all the effort and didn't get the final reward. It's easy to yeah. instantiate this object because you don't need to pass parameters to it. Mm -hmm. But that's not a problem if you move everything to the composition root. Yeah. Again, it's a symptom. 
you're fixing a symptom, right? You don't need default parameters. Only if you have a very good local default, which is not always the case. Most of the times, you don't. You don't want a source code dependency on the UI, with core data, with network stacks, with anything. If you decouple it, it's easier to maintain, reuse, replace, develop, extend. You want all the benefits. Yes, and again, like, be mindful because these things are very easy to understand when you're doing them. If you're finding yourself typing import, you know, core data, and, like 10 imports you know, like, in the same file exactly or 10 imports yes and you have like a declaration of a class subclass in UI view controller you know that's probably not the right place to import these things you know um, you create this source code dependency and you lose everything basically and so here is like you're going to lose everything because of a convenience uh, because of this default parameter thing well it sounds like a bad choice to me but yeah. As you said, the so where where should you put all these things? The composition root. The composition root should have all these import, 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 import statements. Yes. Um, the centralized place right. where all the objects are instantiated and composed. Yes, exactly. It's your it's your main, right? It's it's the main uh, module of your application. Whilst the others, like yeah, like your UI should be able to be composed with uh, core data, with Realm, uh, with any any sort of casting mechanism you want. But if you are to implicitly imply uh, a dependency of core data, bye bye, you know, replaceability, bye bye, <laughs> ease of use and all that stuff, um, it's not going to happen. Yeah. So you also lose independent development, independent deploy, right? Of course. Of course, yes. You can't do that anymore because of the tight coupling there. Or it's going to be super hard and expensive. Yes, exactly. And again, these things are easy to spot. You know, uh, open any legacy code base you want. It's probably full of these things. You know, like a bunch of import statements, uh, very long uh, classes. Yeah. You know. Just try to break a legacy code base into modules, into separate frameworks mm -hmm. or packages. And you see how hard it is. And that's why it's a monolith. Yeah. Okay, next, anti-pattern, service locator. Okay. That's a classic one as well. Yeah. What is a service locator? Well, yeah, on iOS as well, I'd say. Um, so, like to understand the service locator, you need to understand the, the idea of the dependency injection container, which basically is just a, a map. It's like a dictionary for your dependencies, where which concrete type should be used instead of the abstraction at a specific place in your object graph. Right. So it's a way of resolving a dependency. So if I need a component that implements a network interface, this exactly. container is going to give me something that implements that interface. Yes. And you can use frameworks that does that for you. And also helps you with memory management, right? It helps you find retent cycles in your object graph. So it's a tool, right? Dependency yes. injection container is a tool to help you create your object graph. Right. Now, the service locator is when you use this container outside the composition route. Every time you see a class that access some kind of container to get its dependencies, right? Normally in the initializer, you see like the initializer is gonna access some global service yeah. locator. That's the anti-pattern. Instead yeah. of injecting the dependency, you let the component find the dependency or locate the dependency directly with the service locator. Exactly. You should be constraining this to the composition route. Uh, you should not be using it, you know, like a anywhere else just because it's convenient again or easy. You see, by the way, the pattern, like how many words, how many times we've used the word convenience <laughs> for, you know, like as a trade off there. That's, yes. that's a pattern. That should say something to you. And convenience is fine if there's no long term loss. Yes. What is an anti pattern? It's when you have a solution that is better, right? You have a pattern, yes. but you're using something that's suboptimal, right? That generates downsides when there is a better solution to it. 
it's when the consensus has agreed that this thing is going to is going to be problematic for you but yes. you still keep doing it right? and it's only an anti-pattern when you have a better alternative yeah yeah and we do yeah the composition route yeah so that's it don't locate your dependencies you should inject the dependencies from the composition route yes next the control freak anti-pattern and that's okay the anti-pattern we mentioned previously when you create your yes. own dependencies right either by default parameters or you just created in the constructor or in the methods that require them so every time you exactly. initiate a dependency outside the composition root that's it that's the anti-pattern yes exactly and by the way this is much easier to spot and to work with when you're using proper access control so if you are separating your components into modules so you're using all kinds of access control like there's a differentiation between public and internal then you need to find some sort of balance there on on the instantiation because if you have a private class for example a helper class right mm -hmm. let's say you are doing some sort of um, networking let's say you have a json payload that you get from the backend and then you want to map this uh, json to some native objects right let's say you have a mapper and this mapper is a class or a function it doesn't matter and you don't want to inject that because you want it to live inside you know like as a private helper inside right. your networking module you're not gonna inject that you're not gonna set it as public you know and it's gonna live in a perhaps another module no but i think this is a fantastic rule overall don't don't instantiate other components inside other components just inject everything yes leave the instantiation for the composition root because if you don't allow dependency injection if you create your own dependencies you cannot extend behavior you cannot inject mm -hmm. something else mm -hmm. you are limiting your options and that's yes. not ideal so no exactly. control freak nope inject your dependencies next question how to decouple core data from the rest of the system dependency inversion yeah yeah we mentioned that abstract interface make your core data module implemented and injected from the composition root that's it that, that's that that's it yeah next how to decouple networking from the rest of the system same thing dependency inversion principle abstract interface make your networking stack conform to the interface inject it in the composition root every single time you find yourself saying how do i decouple something it's the same thing every single time you know <laughs> just need to have some sort of an abstraction that one component is going to reference and another component is going to implement and that's it like it's an amazing concept yes because your component is going to just see the behavior that needs, right? That needs to collaborate with, not like what's behind this behavior. What is this behavior? If you are dealing with data, where do my data come from? Like, yes, that's it. That's it doesn't it. matter because if it doesn't matter, it doesn't. it's easier to maintain, to develop, to test. Exactly. And extend, replace, etc. Yes. So how can i test drive and decouple store kit from my application same thing yeah <laughs> same Dependency thing inversion principle abstract interface make your store kit module implement the interface and inject from the composition root how to manage coco pods and external libraries in ios projects regarding dependency injection right I mean, again, just just hide them behind uh, a protocol, behind an interface, right? There are a bunch of ways for abstracting in Swift. We recommend protocols. It's uh, 
probably the most like the easiest and the so most solid one but yeah just like it doesn't matter say you, you get a library for fetching images from the network right and so again so convenient to go there and couple your ui with this library no it, you're going to use this library but just hide it behind an interface hide it behind a protocol so your ui doesn't know uh, where the data are coming from because maybe tomorrow there's like a better library and trust me there's going to be a better library for fetching images from the network yeah <laughs> you know um so if you were to couple them you would have to import the module of the cocopod right you don't want to see that if you're seeing that that's a signal right there think twice proceed with caution or yes. rather don't proceed at all <laughs> just delete you know um and even if this library is a singleton right it has a singleton instance put it behind an interface inject the singleton that's it yeah. dependency inversion yeah. and dependency injection patterns inject yeah. from the composition root through constructor exactly. injection and we should mention that this is not just about cocopods because someone might think okay now with the new swift package manager uh, mechanism like uh, I don't have these problems. No, like it's all, it's just this is packages, right? It's like yeah, it's any kind of dependency code that you do not own. Yes, exactly. It's it's any kind of dependency. It doesn't matter. It, uh, the the previous question had to do about StoreKit, right? And StoreKit is like Apple's thing for purchases uh, for in-app purchases. It doesn't matter. Like maybe tomorrow we're gonna have StoreKit too, right? It's yeah. Just protect your code base from these things. Like it, it, it doesn't matter that it's a third-party library. You should you should be you should be protecting your systems. Just hide them. Loose coupling. Yes. Dependency injection. Dependency inversion. That's it. Yeah. Yeah. All right. It's, it's awesome. It's awesome. I think that's it for today. Okay, that was a, uh, yeah, we, we, we talked extensively about some stuff here. Yeah, very technical, tough, simple, but it's not easy. So again, learn, practice, execute, find good mentors, and keep the high standards. It's going to take some time, but that's definitely the way to go. Yes, it's worth it. If you want a remarkable career, if you want to work with remarkable people, if you want to have an amazing salary. If you want fulfillment in your career, that's what you gotta do. Just yeah. high standards, keep practicing, learning, executing, infinite loop. That's it. Let us know your thoughts in the comment section and we'll see you again next time. Bye y'all. See ya.